there, it's Brie Bear, and welcome to a very different video <laughs> from what I originally planned. <laughs> so this is my video uh, to go with my first time reading Twilight series. So if you don't know, back in 2018, I started reading the Twilight Saga for the first time and I vlogged the whole thing. I analyzed the quality of the books for what they are and uh, kind of discussed a lot of different things. So if you'd like to see that experience, the playlist, if I remember, will be linked down below. If not, it is definitely in the cards up above. So you can click that little I and it will give you a menu of different things that I have suggested based off of this video that, you know, go with it. Similar types of videos. That's all going to be Twilight content uh, for this particular video. So if you want to see my other Twilight content, click the I above and you will find it. Um, instead of doing like a longer sit down section this time around, I'm not going to really do that. It's mostly just going to be the vlog sections. Part of the reason for that is because instead of one book, this vlog includes or this video includes three books. It is all of the Twilight bonus content is what I'm calling it. So you have the original series like Twilight, New Moon, Eclipse, and Breaking Dawn. But then you have all the bonus content. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Before we get too far into this, I do want to recognize that I actually read these like a million and 75 years ago. Like, actually, let me, let me check on Goodreads. January of 2020. So I read these at the beginning of last year. Enjoy the footage of me from a year and a half ago when I read these books. And then I read this in the last month. I'm going to first start out with the se short second life of Brie Tanner. Let's go. It is time. Today is the day. I'm very excited. I'm going to be starting with the short life or the short second life of Brie Tanner. It's 178 pages, so it'll take me like two seconds. The tab situation is going to be different from the other books. All right, so I'm only on page four, but so far I'm kind of figuring out a little bit of like the dynamics of Bree's situation. So let's talk about this first. I didn't really know anything about what I was going to experience in this going into it, other than what I already knew from Eclipse uh, when I originally read that. So I didn't really know what to expect or anticipate. And I... I'm already surprised. I was anticipating that Brie had been turned very close to, um, very close to when we met, um, when we met her in Eclipse, but that's definitely not the case. She's at least been turned for long enough to have kind of figured out the ropes of being in Riley's group. Um, which Riley is um, the guy that Victoria has uh, kind of getting this band of uh, kind of vampire warriors, Schultz soldiers of a sense together, created, etc. So like, we're kind of experiencing like that the headlines are bothering Riley and he's told them to stay low, keep things subtle, um, that kind of thing. Um, we're kind of getting an idea of like the dynamic of being a part of Riley's group.
pretty sure that Riley has allowed these vampires that he's created to believe that they really are that he has allowed these vampires that he's created to really believe that they actually are like going to die if they are in the sunlight But to be totally honest, that's actually kind of smart because if they were to n know the truth, then they may be more likely to actually go out into the sunlight and then cause more issues than they already are about not being subtle and, you know that kind of thing. So it's actually kind of smart, but I'm wondering if they're about to figure it out. He's going to experiment. He's experimenting. Diego grinned at me, his face beautiful with light, and suddenly with a deep lurch in my stomach, I realized that the whole BFF thing was way off the mark, for me anyway. It was just that fast. I'm happy and sad at the same time because I know how this is going to Diego had this idea of following Riley and finding out what he's doing and I'm like oh, thank goodness that is a way better plan that that is the thing they need to be doing but I also think it's strange that Victoria is the one turning all of them why doesn't Riley just turn them himself and I recall in the movie it showing Riley doing it not Victoria and furthermore, like, I don't know, I just feel like it's a lot of extra work to have Victoria do it. Like, I don't know, I'm confused by that. Okay, I really think that things are about to get interesting. Four figures were crossing the open field to the house so that Diego and Brie are watching, um... Riley and Victoria interacting, like meeting, and four figures crossing the open field to the house. I'm very curious to see who these four figures are. Not a clue, not a clue. They're wearing cloaks. Okay, so my really crazy theory is that because they're wearing cloaks, the only thing I can think is Volturi, but that wouldn't make sense at all because, like, the Volturi would want to stop them because they're risking the, you know, the secret of vampirism. How one point of the diamond was much smaller than the others? That has to be Jane. That has to be Jane. Oh my god. It's the freaking Volturi. It has to be. We're not here to destroy you yet. Okay, I have a theory now that the Volturi knew about the attack on the Cullens during Eclipse. And they wanted to use this attack to trap the Collins in some way or, you know, get a hold of Alice and them to be able to turn them to, into Volturi, to be able to take their, you know, use their abilities, blah, blah, blah. I think that is what's going on here. That that is, you know, what's about to happen. Yes, my plans are all about them. So basically, they're giving her an out. That if she attacks on the Cullens, they won't destroy her. Oh my god, guys, ah, I promised Diego I'd give you a message. He said to tell you it was a ninja thing. Does that make any sense to you? Oh my god, he's not dead. Riley told them that four times a year the sun shines at a certain indirect angle during this one day four times a year it is safe for us to be outside in the daylight are you kidding that is the weakest thing i've ever experienced that is so incredibly stupid 
Like, you could have come up with so many other ways. So, Stephanie Meyer intelligently, because Brie is sitting here with her eyes closed, not being able to see anything, included that, you know, she's hearing these other names and these all lots of different voices and the howls and she thinks, she still thinks that there are, that they're all vampires. She doesn't know anything about the wolves. So she's like, of course, Riley had lied about the number of vampires here too, which is, I think is interesting that she added that subtle little thing in there that's like very intelligently done because Brie wouldn't know any better. So it's kind of interesting knowing that Edward can hear her thoughts and that she doesn't know that Edward can hear her thoughts. So she's sitting here like trying to, you know, maintain self-control that she really doesn't have because she's a newborn that hasn't ever been taught that there's another way and you don't have to kill humans. I wish so badly that Brie had the chance to at least say something, to talk to the, ah, oh, because then they would have known the truth and then Breaking Dawn would have been so much easier. They would have been so much more prepared. Ah, oh, oh, this is brilliantly done. That Stephanie Meyer has really, really well tied this together to drive us to insanity uh, with how close the Collins have come to never having to experience the nightmare that they experienced during Breaking Dawn. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Well, in some ways, you know, they would have been more prepared. I don't know. All I know is the stress is real. Ooh, the stress is real. I see, I see, I see. Jane, ah, I just had a moment. Ah, this was genius. Jane knew how many they had at the time that she came to Victoria's and Riley's meeting that they had. When she came there, she knew how many they had. And so when she heard 18, she had concerns because she needed to know that they were all gone. In the end for this one, I really, really enjoyed it. I feel like this is almost like should be included as an essential part of the series and not like an addition to the series. Like it, it had a lot um, on its own, like character development and everything. But I also think that the development that it gave us for vampires as a whole and like vampire culture as a whole, as well as the Volturi, like I just think that you should read it if you read the Twilight Saga. That's just me. Next, we're gonna be moving into Life and Death by Stephanie Meyer. Let's go. Okay, five pages in and my first thoughts are that it's like not that different. Like, Bo doesn't have a different voice from Bella. I'm reading this and having to remind myself that this is not Bella, that this is Bo. I'm hoping that maybe Bo kind of settles into his own voice rather than sounding exactly like Bella. Bonnie Black. I cannot. Okay, so if his name is B E A U F O R T. How do you pronounce that? Because he's Bo for short. Like Bella is Isabella, that makes sense. But what the heck is freaking Beaufort or Beaufort becoming Bo? Like neither of those make sense. Beaufort doesn't make sense, but 
shortening Beaufort to Bo also doesn't make sense. There could have been an alternative. Or you could have just left that part out. So we're meeting the Cullens now. Edith, which is Edward, is spelt differently in the book than it is on the back of the book. I added this little section of the teacher passing out quizzes that wasn't there in the original um, text for Twilight. Um, and I, she glanced at the top automatically, 100% dot 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 and I had been been spelling her name wrong in my head that explains why it's Edith with a Y and an E at the end on the back of the book so I was a little bit worried about this but now it's been confirmed so from reading the okay so from reading the foreword which actually read prior to starting the book like actually I read this like maybe last week um but it talked about um what kinds of changes she made um but she made some notes about like the percentages of where some of the changes came from and she said that five percent of the changes I made were because Bo is a boy. 5% of the changes were made because Bo's personality developed just slightly differently than Bella's. The biggest variations are that he's more OCD. I'm not going to read the rest of it. That's what I was really concerned about because the first thing is this. Anybody with a brain would know that you can't be more or less OCD because OCD is not an adjective, it's a noun. It's a disorder. It literally stands for obsessive compulsive disorder, so it's a disorder. So you can't be a more or less OCD than anybody. Furthermore, it's such an incredibly poor use of something that is a mental illness. Obsessive compulsive disorder is not being a neat freak or liking things organized a certain way. Anything to do with what she's referencing. Um, and that's an issue that I see a lot in media um, that you hear a lot when people talk. Um, that they misuse things like OCD, retarded, um things like that and it's gotten better with it's gotten better for sure especially in books with certain things but then there are other things like that you still see all the time um and OCD is one of the main ones that I notice being used in this for light um and it really bothers me as a person that has OCD, it's very upsetting <laughs> to read things that are just like, like if you actually even look up OCD, it's a noun. It's not even an adjective. You're not even using it in the right grammatical context. So here's the stupid thing is like, okay, yes, Stephanie Meyer is stupid for putting it in her book but published this like the publishers didn't change it basically my thoughts are that there are things that i think could be done better 
to make Bo and Edith their own characters and less like Bella and Edward and like more like themselves like tiny things could have been done <sighs> but there's also a lot of small things that she did do to give them their own characters so in some ways they are kind of coming into their own okay guys so it is the next day and i'm doing some more reading and we are coming up on the part where jacob would come in in twilight so let's find out what his name is gonna be when he's a girl his name is julie ah julie black ah! I'm, I'm sorry i can't i don't like jacob so it's kind of funny like trying to like mesh Jacob and Julie together and like imagining him as a girl and wondering if as a girl he would be less stupid. I just got a theory while I was reading and it was that I wonder if if I listened to the audiobook of Life and Death if I would find that Bo stood out more to me as Bo and I would get less Bella vibes. So out of curiosity, I wanted to at least, I didn't want to like listen to the full audiobook, um, at least yet. Maybe I'll reread it via audiobook at some point, but for now, I'm going to listen to the sample of it and see what I think. Okay. That's not bad. Um, I kind of would like to listen to the whole audiobook, to be honest, at some point. Um, but I've never listened to the Twilight audiobooks either. So that might be a fun video series to do, like rereading Twilight via audiobook at some point, maybe. But I would want that to be more down the road. I don't know. Um, what I do think is that um based off of that like i just feel like if you listened to the audiobook it could be easier to imagine Bo as Bo and not read this just thinking of twilight the whole time why and how did it escape me that samantha is sam Bree. <laughs> How did I miss that? <laughs> Disappointed in myself. The changes for like the the four guys that like the thug guys. Um, that section was definitely changed, and I think that it was well done and worked even better than the version of um, Twilight. Um, Edith's voice, I feel like, is much clearer than um, Bo's voice as far as, like, Edith's voice is very distinctly different from Edward's in a lot of ways. I'm able to, like, really see a definitive difference between the two. Um, and Bo's voice is definitely becoming more clear, especially with the inclusion of conversations that would have gone differently or that did go differently in Twilight. Um, we have, uh, another thought that I had was that relationship wise, um, I feel like they're more balanced. Bo and, um, Edith are more balanced based on the inclusion of more conversation and like, the way that they've developed is much more balanced than it was at the beginning of Bella and Edward's relationship. We just did the whole kiss and pass out thing and she didn't change it and she didn't cut it out and I'm so mad about it because it could have been removed and she didn't take it out. So we got to do the part where um, Edith played the lullaby for Bo, and we got to the part where they did 
um, Corinne's history, and now we're about to get the part where they play ball. I am so excited. Lauren makes sense instead of Laurent. And Victor makes sense instead of Victoria. But Joss? Instead of James, Joss? Hey guys, I'm 50 pages away from the end of life and death. And update is that some things are definitely changed. And that's something that she mentioned in the forward of this is that she talked about things that she changed. Um, looking at it now, there are ways she should have been involved and wasn't talking about Alice and her visions. You guys, things just got so crazy. Okay, so here's the deal. In Twilight, it was very different the way that um, the choice was made. Like, there was a definite choice about saving Bo. Or about Sammy and Bella, like that they could let her turn, or he could suck the venom out and hopefully be able to stop himself so that she wouldn't die, like stop once he got all the venom out. But in Life and Death, it said that that wasn't an option that Archie could see that there were only two outcomes, that either Bo would become a vampire or he would die with Edith trying to save him. And also there was this inclusion of, her, um, of Edith trying to use the scalpel to do something but it doesn't say what she's trying to do with the scalpel so i'm very confused as to what the purpose of the scalpel uh, uh, the purpose that the scalpel held um what i wish had been done differently was that it maintained the truth that Bo could have possibly survived. But instead that it had been like Archie saying that there was only a very, very, very slim chance, like that 99 that there was like only like a 1% chance that, you know, there was only one outcome out of a hundred that, that both survived in or something like that, you know, like, I just feel like it could have been approached better so that it wasn't like a completely different story at this point. Cause like this makes, that makes it a completely different story than being Twilight Reimagined. Because they could have made a different choice in this book. From this book. And it still be Twilight Reimagined. Like, that would have fit in the realm. But she changed the lore. And like, the stakes of the situation and that I didn't like. I'm wondering if Bo is gonna have the same kind of self-control that Bella does. Um, clearly he is still a shield I believe um, because of the um, lack of ability that Edith has uh, in reading his thoughts but I'm wondering if that like additional self-control element is going to be present in Bo like it was for Bella when she was turned considering the change you know the difference of him being turned now and not having books two and three and 
kind of having that time difference being with the vampires more and that kind of thing i'm wondering curiosity if Bo is going to hunt like Mela did um and like if that's gonna be similar um but this is nighttime and when Bella first hunted it was day so maybe not for the fact that it's a different time um and so it might not have the hikers thing so wondering how they're gonna find out um that Bo is a shield but can drop his shield when he wants and can project his shield and all of that without the events of Breaking Dawn, you know, bringing who would be Elena in this story into their life in the close proximity, you know, to tell them as much. I'm curious. Things have happened um, and I'm five pages in to the epilogue and um, since the funeral happened, basically there was a proposal, it was garbage. Edith got a phone call. Snarling. Okay, my theory is that it is going to be the wolves. Oh my god, I was right! Oh my god! Oh my god! What? How did she... Why is this in the epilogue? I'm sorry, I'm confused. Why are we doing an epilogue instead of writing another book? So, it's about them thinking that... That they killed Bo. Same like how they think that they killed... Bella. Corinne and Edith are definitely different in the way that they're seeing things as well because um, in Breaking Dawn they definitely were more hesitant and Bella was a little bit less hesitant. Like they were a little bit closer in their hesitation about her seeing Charlie um, after and everything so. Now, Bella was still hesitant about it, and they were still more encouraging about it. But at the same time, they were definitely way more hesitant than they are in this. So, what I do like is that it is maintaining the fact that through wolf interaction, Bo is being caught, uh, forced to be around a human which wouldn't have been the case um, if this had gone otherwise. And so. So confirmed that Bo definitely has the same resistance um, and kind of strength um, that Bella had. So my complaint is, is that she has so many opportunities that she's created for herself without going forth and exploring them so that the readers get to experience it like I'm just saying I'm sorry but if she did a spin-off series of Twilight now even people would freak out over it that's all I'm saying all in all, I did enjoy some aspects of this. However, I feel like she could have done more with it. And I really feel like if she wanted to continue on doing something to do with Twilight, she could have done um, a spinoff series or even a short story collection of, you know, future events with the Cullens. And that would have been a bit more successful. But... You know, she, she has, this has potential. She could have, you know, really worked it a bit more and gotten better. But, uh, yeah, I enjoyed some of the changes and, and everything. I wish she had changed some things that she didn't. Um, but I enjoyed some of the changes and I, I appreciate the artistic, 
and creative liberties that she took. So without any further ado, we are finally moving into Midnight Sun. Let's go. So I've read like only 10 pages so far and one thing, I'm sorry if you can see my fingers and clip moving, I'm trying to get a hair off my mic here. <laughs> Um, one thing that I find interesting is that we are starting right at the first time that Bella and Edward see one another, which is different than I would have probably originally thought, I guess, in some ways, because I, I guess part of me expected it to start kind of at the same time that Bella's did, but this, I guess it makes sense. Now I'm at the car scene. Uh, at the moment, um, Edward has just seen through Alice's visions um, and his ability to see into other people's heads. Um, he saw Alice see Bella and her be best friends. Bella and him are in love, or he is in love with her. He, uh, she, Alice has seen it, figured out that, and then also, she sees that either, um, either Bella becomes a vampire or she dies, and that those are the only two paths that she sees clearly. Um, one thing was. I got really loved getting to see Bella's kindness shining through. Um, page 91, I made a note about that. Um, that we got to see Bella being really kind and things like that and doing all these different things. I really wish we had gotten to see some of that in the original series. I think she would have been a much more enjoyable character if we had really seen you know, some of her actions speaking out in that way. But I don't know, I guess part of it is because we saw it inside her head, it, we just didn't see it that way. Um, page 104. I made a note about how funny it was that Stephanie Meyer tried so hard to making make the sleep stalking scenario seem less creepy than it really still is. Like, she tried so hard to make that not weird. It doesn't matter. It's still weird. <laughs> we did get a tie-in with the title, which I enjoyed. So, it Otherwise, my existence seems like that of a specter rather than a vampire. I hovered invisible in the shadows, where I could follow the object of my love and obsession. Where I could see and hear her in the minds of the lucky humans who could walk through the sunlight beside her. Sometimes accidentally brushing the back of her hand with their own. I'm getting some mad stalker vibes. I am obsessed with absolutely everything about this section where Edward went to Carlisle and was like, look, there's this horrible person out there that tried to um, rape and planned to rape and murder Bella. Um, there's no way we can let that guy walk around town but also I couldn't just go up and kill him so what do we do here and Carlisle came up with a plan and they like enacted it to keep people safe from that guy um which I am obsessed <laughs> like I love so much about this everything about this idea to to take care of that that bad guy and not just leave it empty and open-ended Oh, I love that she tied that off with a nice pretty bow and made it so satisfying. I am obsessed. 
I am 417 pages into Midnight Sun at this point. I haven't checked in because I haven't had any significant thoughts that I felt like I needed to check in for. And I feel like the main reason for that is because most of this reading experience is not any plot twists or anything like that. It's not any changes to the story really. It's just a re done version of the original story from Edward's perspective. Um, and I feel like this would have been more enjoyable to have been read before we got too far into the series simply because of the fact that it most of what's in this is stuff that we kind of know and understand at this point um so i feel like if you're wanting to reread twilight but not reread twilight then this is an option but it's not a new story it's not you know, overwhelming me in any particular way. It's just rereading the first book is what it feels like. But additionally, I also feel like, um, like there were some opportunities for her to have, you know, gone in and tweaked some things and played with some mistakes that she made in the first, um, book and at the time that it was originally written that she could have changed but unfortunately she didn't do that and i know like in um life and death when she released that she chose to make changes and kind of make it its own story with a similar premise and a similar backdrop similar characters and just gender swapping a lot of things like so I can I can understand that maybe she didn't want to do that with this one because a she had done it in the previous uh, She had made so many changes with life and death that she wanted to be like Close to the you know, she really wanted this to be the same thing. So I get it in some ways, but also She did have the opportunity to try to you know, she could have put an, a note at the beginning and be like, hey been like hey look since releasing this uh twilight the original series um some things have come to my attention that are you know problematic i'm going to take the liberty of correcting my mistakes like when she says i am so clumsy i'm practically or like almost disabled stuff like that we could have fixed that and i don't think that many people would have been stupid about it and that i'm currently at the part after bella sees edward in the sun for the first time and it is the final stretch i feel like this would have been more enjoyable if she had branched out a bit more and focused on other elements and things that we didn't see or experience in the original series so things outside of when Bella and Edward were together or thing, you know, things like that, like things within the family more. Like we did get some additions to that uh, aspect. We got more interaction with Rose and like why she thought what she thought and felt the way she did and everything. Like we did get some more elements there, but in the end, I still feel like we could have had much more, uh, you know, just small moments and experiences at home outside of like every second with Bella and everything like every conversation we had with Bella, we didn't necessarily have to have the exact same things in this. We could have had a summary of the conversation in a paragraph or two, um, or a summary of some of those interactions, you know, as like a, a transition, like not an info dump, but like to skip into some other elements. So it wouldn't have been 
unable to stand on its own as a book because I know that's a concern as well that you do want it to be able to stand alone that if you read Midnight Sun first you would be able to follow kind of what's happening and you wouldn't be missing things but still I just feel like you could have done something new with this book that would have been more enjoyable to a person who is re uh, wanting to read it because they were a fan of Twilight, you know? Because most people that are picking this up are not picking it up before they read Twilight. They're picking it up because they read Twilight, you know? So, um, we're getting, like, an excessively enjoyable amount of detail here about Alice actually going through and with her visions, she's playing it out, um and planning what she's going to do to cover up everything and make it uh, a believable story without holes in it and everything. And it's quite enjoyable to see that because that's not really any information that we got in the first book uh, originally. So getting to see that side of things is enjoyable and like how they made it make sense and seem... <laughs> normal and not crazy so yeah okay so this is kind of random but he started praying not to the god of vampires but to the god of humans capital G God and um it's not a I definitely believe in a god a situation it's a if one existed at all but it's just interesting to me I don't know if I really like it or not because it's kind of random and I don't know but it's there I tabbed it I'm done all in all for Midnight Sun it just didn't do enough for me to warrant the length or the creation of the story of this volume itself like so much of it was like copy and paste with changing in between the conversations like she just took a conversation copied it from the twilight document pasted it in here and then changed the stuff in between the dialogue to fit whoever's perspective we were in which is not my favorite i also feel like we could have just gotten so much more of the cullens or of edward's life outside of bella but it was like he had no life outside of bella um so yeah okay. so before i wrap this all up um i want to give you guys like a little bit of a comparison of which one was my favorite to my least favorite. So it actually goes in the order that I read them. So Free Tanner was my favorite, Life and Death my second favorite, and Midnight Sun my least favorite. There you go. That's it. That's it for this video. I'm not going to do any other final thoughts. Um, short and sweet on my filming today, but a lot of effort went into the reading and vlogging portion because, uh, yeah, that's a lot of book. That's a lot of pages. Like, that's a lot of pages. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day or night, whatever time it is for you. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell down below so that you're notified every time I post new videos. I will see you guys tomorrow with another booktube beta video. Peace out, Bear Scouts.